Are you willing to sell your soul to the devil for wealth, power, and fame? Good morning, everyone. This is our reflection question for today. Twenty-three years ago, CFO, a publishing and award-giving body, gave Enron Finance Chief Andrew S. Fasto a CFO Excellence Award in the category of Capital Structure Management. In a feature story naming him an award recipient, Fasto said, Our story is one of a kind. Little did he know how prophetic those words would soon become. His financial wizardry turned a sleepy natural gas pipeline company into a blazing energy trading firm. At its height, Enron was the seventh largest company in America. His financial wizardry, as it turned out, was smoke and mirrors, designed to mask Enron's true financial performance. The company filed for bankruptcy on December 2, 2001, putting thousands out of work. Most of Enron's employees had invested their retirement savings in the company's stock. Other shareholders lost billions. Fasto was charged with 78 counts of fraud for his central role in developing the off-balance sheet special purpose entities that led to the company's collapse. He forfeited his net worth of $24 million and served a six-year prison sentence. He was released in December 2011. He has since been invited to give speeches to university business students and organizations of certified fraud examiners. In one of them, he held his CFO Excellence Trophy on his right hand and his prison identification card on his left. His thesis was on rules versus principles. He said, I found every way I could to technically comply with accounting rules, but what I did was unethical and unprincipled, and it caused harm to people. For that, I deserved to go to prison. He was not alone though, as all his structured transactions were approved by Enron's accountants, senior management, board of directors, external and internal attorneys, bank attorneys, and its audit firm, who after the Enron debacle shut down its auditing business. He asks, how is it possible to have all these smart people approve these deals and end up committing the greatest fraud in corporate history? It is because people try to find loopholes to exploit in the rules. The question was not if he was following the rules or not, but if his behavior was ethical. He misled the regulators and investors. He believes human nature leads some people to do whatever they can to win, including bending the rules. That's why many companies' financial results appear better than they are. In other words, you can commit fraud and still be technically within the rules. Today's Gospel reading gives us a powerful statement from Jesus for us to reflect on. He says, What profit is there for one to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit himself? Everyone wants a better life. No one wants to be poor. We all want the best for our families. We work hard, we earn money, and for some of us, we reach the rarefied zone few attain, the peak of success, wealth, and fame. We pray, we dedicate ourselves to God. We have in fact prayed so hard and worked so hard all our life to reach our present status. We even became members of a charismatic community. We devoted ourselves to serve in the parish. But along the way, we encountered the same Satan who tempted Jesus in the desert and offered him the wealth, splendor, and glory of all kingdoms if Jesus and us were to worship him. In our weakness, in our hunger for more, for more than what we originally aspired for, perhaps we succumbed to temptation and veered from the path to eternal life. We started to serve two masters and mammon won out because we wanted the quickest way the easiest way, the fastest route to power and riches by bending rules, bribing, doing the unethical, and making excuses for them to acquire more. We have let our pride and greed take over when we compromised our soul for the world. Father Alphonse writes, For those of faith, death is not the worst thing that can happen. Dying on the wrong side is the worst thing that can happen. As a priest, I've seen a lot heard a lot and learned a lot. I've learned a lot about people, especially at funerals. I've learned that being right all the time is not as important as being loving all the time. I've seen how people react to loss. I've heard many eulogies, 
I've learned that when the deceased loved little, the eulogies were filled with sorrow and answered questions, and remarkably, wise cracks and jokes that were almost belittling the deceased person. Of course, not in a distasteful manner, but in a very subtle and fine-tuned manner. But I've learned that when the deceased loved a lot, their eulogies were filled with joy, gratitude, and plenty of stories and examples of how the deceased impacted their life and how the joke was on them. We are all called to be faithful by oftentimes saying no to the risky path that leads to sin. We are called to say yes, enjoy life, but not in the manner that will destroy our soul, but in the way Moses expressed it, to choose life, meaning to follow God's commandments. How more? Well, by dying to oneself, that is, by taking up our cross and following Christ, to do what is right by loving more, forbearing and forgiving always, by imitating the sacrificing love of Jesus for us, by renouncing the pride and vanity that corrupts our soul and destroys others. When we live to love, we bring life to ourselves. By renouncing sin, we choose life. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, help me be true to my calling of steadfastly following you. By carrying my cross, and not falling into sin through pride, envy, vanity, and greed. This I pray in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your families, brothers and sisters. God bless our Catholic faith and couples for Christ.